Blog Talk Radio. Yo, 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 what's up, what's up, world? It's badass thugging like I usually do. And you better turn it up, bust some speakers out, because we off the motherfucking cup. You dig how we do it? Dog Pound Gangsters 2000 and beyond. Yo, yo, check this out. This is your girl, Cora Boat, and I'm chilling with my boys right here on Off the Cuff Radio. Because we're off the cuff right now. You big? Bet. Uh oh. What's up? What's up? It's your boy, Lil Yap, with UNLV. Ragging them from the river. Cooling with my homies and my family at Off the Cuff Radio. Y'all be sure to tune in on Fridays and get the latest scoop and find out what's happening. You hoit me? And it's Queen Crazy, your girl's favorite bartender. And we're from Sex on the Rocks Podcast. Alright, you're now tuning in to Off the Cuff Radio. Yeah, because they keep representing that world hip hop. Well, much love. Alright. Giving a shout out to the live show on Friday nights off the cuff radio. And I'm live from the 704. Make sure y'all tune in for the blazing hot music. Hey y'all, this is Stacey Lache giving a shout out to King Eric and off the cuff radio. What's shaking, y'all? This is the grand. One half of Lost Cause and one third of that drive time thing. Sending my love to the homies over at Off The Cuff Radio. Tune in every Friday night for some real, still hip-hop conversation. These dudes are the connoisseurs of this thing. You already know what it is. BX Stand Up, Hud City, we're shaking. Peace. Yo, this is Joe Fresh to and y'all tuned in to the most raw, uncut show on radio. The guillotine team, Off The Cuff. And yo, Eric Sandman, Off The Cuff. Yes, sir, we bar. We getting straight to the interview, y'all. Welcome to a special episode of Off the Cuff Radio, the live is hip-hop show on Friday nights. And now we could basically say Sunday nights because we're going in overdrive right now. Episode 345 is underway, and we're sponsored by Buddy Boy Entertainment, Core Financial, Jesse's Boutiques, Screwball Radio, and Dirty Basement. I got my host, t Mass with the facts in the building. What up, what up? It's OTC in the building. It's Sunday Funday, and we got another, you know, historical show, you know, tonight, King. Um, You know, we've had a lot of guests on here, but this is the first time that we have ever had a record store owner, you know, and not only a record store owner on the show, this man right here is one of the legendary luminaries of Long Beach, Kelvin Anderson Sr. is one of the stalwarts, the most distinguished, the most respected, you know, uh, VIP Records Long Beach. And we are so honored, we are so privileged to have him on this show tonight. And without further ado, let's bring on Mr. Kelvin Anderson Sr., the head of VIP Records, Long Beach. Stand up, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening? What's happening? Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir, can, man. sir. All right, all right. What's man? It's good to be on. Uh, been doing my little research on on you guys. Uh, hadn't didn't really know a lot about the show, but uh, you guys are doing doing great work and stuff. I see you just had had one of my Best cats from the West Coast, West Coast Cam on recently. Yeah. And uh, I got a chance to check out some of that. But, uh, yeah, man, uh, appreciate you guys having me. Man, we appreciate you. Man. Man. Um, yes, I mean, dude, it's just like, you know, you know, you are one of the you, – you're, you're one of the most esteemed individuals in Long Beach you know, in all of California in terms of your contributions to hip-hop culture with your establishment. Um, 
you know, through and through representing that five six two, man. I mean, um <laughs> but before you establish, you know, your foundation, you know, your roots there, tell us a little bit about yourself and you know, you know, just your life and how everything progressed to where it is now. We got a couple hours, so I mean, hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure I can give you a little time, but, you know, I got a, probably a pretty interesting career. Uh, you know, I'm, this is uh, year number 48 in the business. Mm. Uh, 40, almost 42 years of those was is as a, a store owner. But uh, I started in 1972 right out of high school, born and raised in Brandon, Mississippi, right outside of Jackson. Uh, I have an older brother, well, actually three older brothers that were in the business before me, but my oldest brother, Cletus Anderson, uh, started the first VIP record store in 1967 in South Central uh, L.A. Mm. And uh, two days after graduating from high school in 1972, I uh, came out, uh, (laughs) it was interesting uh, because I was kind of born and raised like on a farm like in Mississippi. Matter of fact, uh, as I remember, when I moved out here in 72, we were still living on a dirt road. (laughs) So Mm. from, uh, I left Jackson, Mississippi around 6 o'clock, May 24th, 72. I got to L.A. around 10.30 L.A. time. My brother picked me up from the airport. Uh, took me to breakfast, took me by his house, drop off my bags, and by 1 o'clock I was in the record business. So my life changed dramatically from a country boy to a uh, brick city out here. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, the first VIP store, like I said, was started in 67. I joined in 72. And when I joined in 72, my brother started expanding and started opening up other stores. So we was kind of all over. Uh, L.A. County, Pasadena, Inglewood, Compton. A lot of people, it was only for me with VIP Long Beach, but uh, VIP Long Beach is like store number eight of the chain. Oh, wow. So we had a lot of VIP. We did a lot of uh, good work and great things before, uh, you know, before VIP Long Beach. Actually, we did a lot of big things before rap and hip-hop. But, uh uh, you know, yeah, we we got, you know, like I said, interesting, uh, uh, interesting uh, time here on the West Coast, and uh, really, uh, when it comes to rap music, uh, I remember a lot, a lot of the things I've done here in Long Beach, just the things that I saw my brother do when I was working for him in L.A., because he was kind of, uh, he was very involved in uh, uh, independent artists. He actually recorded the first ever Ice T record. So the mm. first rap song that Ice T did, uh, it was done. Uh, my brother was the uh, person behind that. And uh, at that time, I used to see him uh, go and pick up Dr. Dre and bring him to the studio to mix and scratch on projects that he was working on. Uh, I know he did a lot of work with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis when they first came out here from Minneapolis. So a lot of the stuff that I I've done here in Long Beach is just stuff that I you know saw him do uh, earlier on, and uh, you know that's part of the early days of VIP. I mean, you, I mean, Mr. Anderson. I mean, you, you 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 we're we're barely like ten minutes in, and you're just you already hit us with these historical moments. I mean, <laughs> did you did you? I mean, ice. I mean, Ice T, Jimmy Jam, and Terry Lewis, Dr. Dre. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you. I mean, did you all? It's one thing to see these individuals in terms of you know showcasing their musical talents. Um, did you all have any idea the legendary status that these individuals would make in terms of uh, as the? Because you got because I mean this is still in the days when hip hop on the West Coast was still kind of in its nascent phases. You know, in terms of it was right. still going, it was still finding, you know, its way. You know, uh, right. Um, you know, so I mean, but did you know that these that these were these, these individuals are going to be of not only legendary status, but you know, like the um, basically like just just the individuals that were really influenced. Well, you know, I, I know that they were very they were very talented, 
and as as big and as great that they are and uh, has been, it's just so many, so many, so many uh, missed the boat. And what I say about missing the boat is that, man, it was a lot of guys, and, you know, and that's been the problem, one of the struggle with all these years here in the business is that uh, all of these talented people, rappers, singers, producers, who just never really got their shot. They just never got their shot in. One thing about the West Coast is that I used to get a lot of cats call me from, you know, Chicago, Atlanta, uh, you know, uh, Texas, and, like, you know, they send me their project and ask me if I would listen to it, and I would listen to it. And, uh, you know, I would tell them, you know, gave, give them my opinion on it. And they like, well, you know, I'm thinking about coming out there to launch my, I'm like, uh-uh. You need to stay where you are uh, because West the, the West Coast is just not independent friendly. So, like I mm. say, there's so many, so many artists that was just uh, neighborhood hits. You know, they never, because it couldn't get radio play, we didn't have social media. So, you know, you were just the biggest artist in your neighborhood. And because of the game situation, uh, heck, uh, Compton is like miles away. If you're the dopest rapper in Long Beach, you can't go to Compton and do a show. You can't go to Inglewood. So because mm-hmm. of, you know, the stigma behind it, your um, uh, your um, uh, chance to move around or to go out and market and promote yourself was, hey, it just didn't exist uh, for those reasons. So I tell Cass, I'm like, man, hey, you in Houston. You can go to Dallas, you can go to Fort Worth, you can go to Irving, do shows, and ain't nobody going to die. <laughs> so we didn't have that freedom of movement out here. Uh, even though, you know, it was kind of crazy, a lot of times artist music was supported, they just couldn't visit the neighborhood. It was like, you know, with the, you know, I never could understand that. But that was just the reality of, uh, you know, the West Coast and um, the gang life. Yeah, um, because when you talk about 1972, Mr. Anderson, um, because we got to give uh, one thing about this show that we pride ourselves on to the best of our abilities, King and myself, you know, Sandman and Lady Chinchilla, our other co-hosts, is that we always try to give a little bit of our listeners that history lesson to further give clarity to, because, you know, people got to understand, you know, of course, the Crips, Stanley to you know, Stanley Tukey Williams and Raymond Washington, both rest in peace. You know, Crips started in right. 69. Bloods was started around 1971 in terms of Pyru. Right. And people have to understand how that would eventually break off because the Bloods actually started in prison in the jail system in California, L.A. County in 72, but the Bloods predated them. The Pyrus predated them by one year in 71. So you're having right. three gangs within – five years really, really begin to, uh, from where you had, you know, the Crips, then you had, you know, of course, you know, the Pyrus where you had some of the smaller games, like you had the Gladiators, the Brims, you know, you had the Family Swans, you know, and this would become, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a long and, you know, uh, intricate history of the inception. Um, Yeah, well. And what's your, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please. Well, with me, I just know that they existed, you know. I was, right. you know, uh, I've always, VIP is, has always been and will always be all hoods. All mm. hoods. So there's no color line here. It, it was, it was kind of interesting. Uh, um, now, and how the studio came about here in VIP, at VIP in the early 90s, we were very involved with uh, the uh, NWA movement uh, when they first came on the scene. And the next big movements was uh, E-40 and Too Short and the Cats in the Bay Area. Uh, that was the next big West Coast uh, movement. And so after that early 90s, the gang life was so bad here in Long Beach between two Rival crip groups, uh, twenties and insane. You know, they were like, yeah, 
killing each other on a, on a weekly basis and stuff, and and a lot of it was revenge killing and stuff. So, uh, I, you know, it, I was like, you know, right around the corner from where my store is at during that time was a mortuary. And for like six weeks mm. straight, I came to work on a Monday morning, and it would be somebody back there in the mortuary dead between the ages of like 14 and 24, uh, uh, revenge killing. And uh, and half of those that was killed was like innocent bystanders or somebody who was trying to break the situation up. So mm-hmm. – uh, thinking on, you know, like I said, the stuff that I had experienced with my brother, I said, uh, well, you know, maybe if I open, saw the recording studio, you know, one thing, it would give uh, uh, kids a safe place to, to hang out. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, Mike could find some real talent here in the neighborhood. So uh, I got together with uh, Sir Jinx. And if you know who Sir Jinx is, he's yes. Dre's <laughs> cousin. Yes. So Sir Jinx, Sir Jinx is actually yes. the guy who's responsible for helping me uh, uh, open, uh, put the recording studio together. He came to me one day and told me uh, he had heard I wanted to open a recording studio. So I said, uh, yeah. I said, uh, he said, well, come, come go with me and let me show you something. So he took me to his house. And he showed me this machine, and he asked me, did I know what it was? I said, no, I don't have a clue. He said, well, it's called a SP-1200 drum machine. He said, mm-hmm. now, if you get this machine and a couple other pieces, and so we can do the studio because this this uh, drum machine is virtually a recording studio when itself. Within itself, we can do all of the beats. We can even uh, record the vocals into it, mix down. And you know, produce uh, demo tapes. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, and, but what's interesting about that situation was that he said, "Now he said, you see this machine? He said this machine belongs to Dre. He said, now the closest I can get to this machine is over his shoulder, so he can see him work on it, but he couldn't touch it. So mm-hmm. I actually uh, left there and went down to the guitar center and spent twenty five hundred for a brand new SB1200 drum machine and gave it to him. And like three months later, he came back and said, okay, I'm ready. And so that's when we put together the makeshift uh, recording studio in the back of VIP in the early 90s. And I told a couple of other guys that worked for me at the time how to program um, Keith Thompson, DJ Slice, uh, and uh, L.C. Rose was actually working for me at the time, but very interested in the music. So he taught them how to uh, program the, and do beats on the drum machine. So from 10 a.m. to almost 10 p.m., we would have a sturdy floor of kids coming through, going to the back room, uh, learning to rap, uh, learning to produce, learning to DJ, uh, you know, <laughs> Sing, dance, the whole thing, and so uh, that's kind of how it, how it got started. Uh, after working with one kid here in the neighborhood who we thought had the most talent, he had actually went by the stage name of Radio. Uh, mm-hmm. He actually passed away from like leukemia uh, years mm-hmm. later, but he actually was signed to Interscope Records. Uh, we got him a deal at Interscope, and after that we focus our attention on 213 which was Snoop Warren yeah. and Nate. Yeah. It was the second act that we really focus on and uh, you know we all know that story uh, so uh, 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 you know and, and you know it, it, it was so many people in and out to you know sometimes I would lose track but I was really amazed at years later when uh, DJ Quick, who was one of my favorite artists, DJ Quick, uh, he came to me one day and he said, do you know that my career started in the back of your mm-hmm. store? I said, yeah, sure it did. I said, you are blood and you're going to tell me that you were hanging out at VIP in the 90s? He said, yep. <laughs> I sure <it> was. <laughs> he said, uh, and when he told me the story, I knew he had to be telling the truth because he said, yeah, you got that uh, guy that was 
doing beats for you, DJ Slice. I said, yeah. He said, well, I was there one day, and uh, he was, he had took Zap Computer Love and flipped it and put a beat on it, and this dude was rapping to it. I said, yeah, uh, DJ Slice and GQ Steve and DJ Slice. So I'm like, uh, he said, well, that day, he said, I left and went and bought a drum machine and bought the SP-1200 drum machine. He said, my life haven't changed. You know, my life uh, hasn't been the same since. So he, uh, I was shocked. But then I would periodically get people come and say, you know, I used to be a store, in the back of your store all the time and would name other people that were back there. So I knew they had to know what they were talking about. Matter of fact, Jamie Foxx during that time used to be a regular in the back of the store. He wanted to be down with, you know, one of the cliques, uh, line block, but, you know, he just wasn't, he wasn't that gangster <laughs> to be with them <laughs> cats. But it, it, it was interesting, man. It was interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, hey, I mean, it worked out, it worked out pretty good for Jamie at the end because, you know, this was, you know, a lot oh, yeah. of people don't know that Jamie, you know, because Jamie came, uh, was originally from Texas. I believe he's from Houston. You know, and um, hmm. you know, he came to L.A. to try to make it. You know, to really try his hand. You know, of course, he was a stand-up comedian. We all know early nineties, yeah. he would yeah. end up being on in Living Color. You know, uh, yeah. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, but when you're talking about DJ Quick, and this is another bit of history that we got to give our listeners out here. Long Beach, what, what Mr. Anderson is saying about Quick being a blood. Shout out to TTP Treetop Pyru. Um. This is especially kind of real because in Long Beach, there are no blood sets. Literally, <laughs> when I say there are no blood sets, there are literally no blood sets in Long Beach, period. Yeah. <laughs> you got the yeah. Insane's, 20s, you know, Asian Boy Crips, a.k.a. Family Exotics. I mean, yeah. you know, they're, they're, that's just 19th few, Street. They, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and and what's crazy itself, if we want to talk about the game situation, like I said, I started in South Central, uh, right mm-hmm. on 108th and Main Street. So, uh, you know, I felt game a little bit. Uh, and then I we opened a store on Vernon and Figueroa. So I felt mm-hmm. game a little bit there. Now, after that, we opened a store in Pasadena. Now, in Pasadena, there are only bloods. Mm-hmm. Now, I I didn't really feel it and stuff. And then we uh, the next store we opened was the best ever VIP record. Period was on 28th and Crenshaw in West LA. Now VIP Long Beach might be the most popular store, but that was the best ever VIP record store. It was on 28th and Crenshaw in West LA. You know our customer base then was mostly stars, celebrities. Uh, you know, the oh. solo train dancers used to come through. Uh, we had uh, customers like Barry White, Red Fox, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, right down the street from, you know, it was on it was on, on the Crenshaw Strip, man. It was it was like that. Uh, that's when we got high recognition from a lot of the record labels for being able to move a lot of product and move a lot of product that received zero airplay because of our in-store play comp, uh, capabilities and stuff. You know, in the 70s, we had uh, employees that were just, their job was a DJ. <laughs> that was it, you know. That's all they did was play music. And, you know, uh, you would come in the store to buy uh, Marvin Gaye. Well, when he found out what you wanted, he would drop everything that was in that circle uh, uh you know, to push another piece of product. Say, if instance, you came in and you bought the Georgia Mass Choir. Well, he's going to try to sell you the Florida Mass Choir, the Mississippi Mass Choir, because in you buying the Georgia Mass Choir, that let him know what you were kind of interested in. So just by that, uh, using those skills, we were able to push a lot of independent artists that was not getting any airplay and stuff. So we had our marketing strategy was unmatched. Yeah, you know, and one thing about it, Miss Anderson, is that when you're seeing the uh, the West Coast blow, 
And I got to say, I'm part, when you said Georgia Mass Choir, I got to say I'm partial to that on my gospel choir because, I mean, especially what they did on Whitney Houston's I Love the Lord on the uh, Preacher's Wife soundtrack. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. That song gives me chills yeah. every time I listen to it. Yes. You know, yeah. um, so, you know, so when we're going to this uh, age um, of the of the 80s, of course, because, I mean, we're talking about, you know, uh, of course, you know, Mixed Master Spades, Hottie T. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. a lot All of, of those cats. Yeah, 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 a lot of those cats, uh, you know, uh, spend a lot of time. I mean, I, I uh, still from time to time talk to Hottie T, but, I mean, we were we were the driving force behind that movement. Um, you know, give you a little of more history on VIP. Uh, VIP mm-hmm. was the first for so many different things and stuff. We actually sold the first ever rap record on the West Coast. Now, we all know that the Sugar Hill Gang wasn't the first rap group, but if you think of a national level, they were the first rap mm-hmm. group. And back right. then, uh, Sylvia Robinson, who owned uh, Sugar Hill Records, Sugar Hill she Records. was, yeah. I guess, friend with uh, my brother Cletus. So she had sent us to the uh, Rappers of Life project and asked us if we would take a listen to it and to see if we think we could sell it. So we listened to it, and we knew right off that we could sell that. So what we did is that we put it in all of our stores uh, location, and it was blowing up. And we actually had an association with uh, all, basically all of the independent retail stores in 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 LA County. So we ended up getting it in a lot of those stores. And so that was like way before K Day Radio went on it. So mm. I mean, it started. You know, I can honestly say that we sold the first ever rap record on the West Coast, which was the Sugar Hill Gang. Man, I mean, what was it like in terms of that operation back in the day? Because, I mean, you all being an independent uh, uh, independent enterprise, um, which I've always had love for, because especially, I mean, in L.A., you're seeing, you know, guys like Ice-T, you know, N.W.A., you know, you're seeing these guys right. really blow up. And then, of course, you know, quick, you know, we would have King T, right. you know, Compton's Most Wanted. Uh, right. I mean, you know, this was – I don't think people really understand the West Coast in terms of the movement y'all had. I mean, when you talk about E-40 and Too Short, I mean, the Bay Area, I mean, we've had Richie Rich right. on the show a couple of times. You know, and you right. know, Richie Uncle Rich like is unequivocal right. in his declaration of speaking. This short is short dog, the one that opened up the door for all of us in the Bay. You know exactly. Um, the, you and, know. and and my 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 interest interesting story on Too Short is this. Uh, mm-hmm. Back during his you know his time before ever getting a deal, we had a customer that lived here in Long Beach, but they was from the Bay Area. So Mm -hmm. every time they would go to the Bay Area to visit, they would bring back this too short, uh, a too short cassette. So... On 75 Girls Records, right? uh Uh-uh, before that. Oh, oh, (laughs) oh, before that. 75 Girls, okay. Yeah, before that. So what happened was, uh, uh, you know, back then, mixtapes was real popular and stuff. So, uh, I, you know, people come in and want certain things on tape, and we would put put it on tape for them. Well, he he would he would we would get a whole project from him, like maybe eight to ten songs, and so uh, uh, I start making them copies of them, and so my 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 street team was this back in during that time. My street team was that guy sitting at the park with this big LL Cool J radio, drinking beer, playing dominoes all day, blasting music, I would give him a free copy. That same cat mm-hmm. in a low rider with the booming system so loud it'll make your ears bleed. I would give him a copy. <laughs> and guess what guess what they are doing all day long? Bumping it. Was it? And people like yeah. man, where can I get that? And it was just pointing right back to VIP. So 
I I I had at least two two short cassettes to go gold before he even ever got a deal. It was funny that uh, 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 Barry Wise, the owner of Jive Records at the time, he had called one day and he said, uh, he said, uh, 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 he said, we we in the Bay Area and we we thinking about signing this kid. Uh, we want to know. You ever heard of somebody called Too Short? And it was funny. I said, Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, I'm familiar with Too Short. He said, Well, we are thinking about signing, and what do you think? And so I'm like, Man. I said, look, he's got two underground tapes that win gold here. <laughs> uh, you'd be crazy not to sign him and stuff. And so, he, you know, the next call I got from him said that, you know, they did sign him. So the rest is history. But, uh, yeah, man, I mean, my, my, my thing is this. I can actually listen to something and tell you if I can sell it or not because, uh, I know my customer base. So a lot of times, right. you know, I would go to a listening party or I would get this CD in the mail or this, you know, and I would listen to it and I already know who I'm going to sell it to. So because I knew my customer base, uh, I was able to, uh, you know, like I say, listen to stuff and, and let you know whether or not I can sell it. But uh, in which, you know, a lot of things that, uh, you know, uh, it, a lot of things wouldn't have if it you wasn't for you know people like me. Matter of fact, rap music had it not been for independent retail, rap music would not have made it because it, it had no radio was not going to touch it. It had no outlets. Mm-hmm. Right. Record stores across this country played it and stuff. So I remember one day being in a meeting at uh, Capitol Records and they was have a round table and they were trying to figure out what makes a hit rap song. What are the key elements of a hit rap song? <laughs> and so when it came around for my time to speak on it, I said, well, uh, I said, uh, 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 a hit rap song is the beat first because if you got you bobbing your head, okay, it's the beat first. And then I said, the next is the hook. And, uh, you know, I said, the verses really ain't that important. My early rap, the verses were not that important. As a matter of fact, I said, uh, you guys got a big record that they're playing on the radio now. I said, they playing the loonies. I got five on it. I said, yeah. now, outside of when the music come on, you start bobbing your head. And then you hear them, I say, you hear them say, I got five on it. I said, I want one person in here to give me one sentence of a verse. Nobody could. And it was their project. <laughs> I said, because it don't really mean that. It don't matter. You know? <laughs> it, it don't matter. Versus, versus today, not today, is a whole different story. Totally different story. Because uh, I have uh, my, my nephew is uh, Al Soul. And Al Soul, of course, Black you know, he's a part of... Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's my yeah. that's my oldest brother, oldest grandson. So he's deeply embedded into the the, the retail side of the business. So I went to uh, one of his shows, and Afro, it was Afro what? Afro Kendrick, Schoolboy, and one more. Uh, J-Rod. That was a part of J-Rod. Okay. So I, and, and Afro was the only one of the first original four that wasn't signed to a major. So he didn't get mm-hmm. a lot of that attention and radio play that a lot of the other ones did. But it was amazing that I went to one of his shows and uh, the place was packed. And and the, and the whole 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 audience was repeating his 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 lyrics word for word. I'm like, man, that was that was shocking to me because like I said they didn't hear it on the radio and uh, the fact that they they do, they didn't just know hooks, they knew verses so that kind of tripped me out because uh, in, in my day in early rap you didn't know nothing but the hook and the beat but uh, right. you know, that was, that's, that's one of the big differences I see today uh, in, in rap music is that 
uh, kids now they they seem to know all of the verses, <laughs> which tripped me out. You know, hey, you know and, you and it's wild. Go ahead, Ken. I say you have that musical ear where within the first five seconds you can know it's a hit record or you know it's going to smash. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No, it don't. It don't take. It don't take long. And then you know, but there are, and a lot of people don't know this. There are. It's two kind of hit records. It's an instant mm-hmm. hit record, and it's a manufactured hit record. So now. I have to learn about that, and 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 people who were great at it was Def Jam, Bad Boy, uh, Interscope. I'm telling you because see, back in the day, a label would come to us like, you know, they would come to us and say, okay, we're going to go after this project, and so uh, right, and you know they were paying us to promote and push it, so we had to get on it. So you would come in the store, and I'm like, okay, we got this brand new whatever. And we would play it for you in store, and you're like, eh, nah, I'm I'm cool and stuff. Give me that or whatever. So, but two weeks later, after you done heard it a hundred times on the radio, you done saw the video on BET and MTV uh, another hundred times, and you, you would come in there and ask for that record that I've been trying to sell you the last three times you've been in there. So you can they can beat something in you until you start liking it, you know, because, you know, I don't care what other people say. If Eminem would have been on priority, he never would have made it and stuff. Because when we first got the project for the first couple of months, we couldn't give it mm-hmm. away. But because it, it, every time you turn your radio on, you heard it, you, you, it grew on you. And that's that's gonna happen a lot of times. So I'm like, you know, it, it was crazy. We couldn't give away country grammar when Nelly first made it and stuff. People wasn't they wasn't feeling it out here, but she is. <laughs> At the end of the first, the ball is about the six week mark and stuff. They start feeling it because every time you heard turn the radio on, you heard it. So the, you can make a hit record just by. Pounded it in the people. And but, uh, I you was, know what? I was in love with yeah, the ahead, instant hits. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you know, it's wild though because of the fact of, you know, and King and myself, we're sitting here and we're just like, just, just we're just like in awe of all of this history that we're getting <laughs> because it's like, <laughs> That's we knew so this quiet, was going to be good. <laughs> Huh? Dude, this show is gonna be That's why good. I'm so quiet, just soaking all this up. <laughs> it's like, look, we Man, knew you this know show what? was gonna my, be. Go ahead, go ahead. My, my, my biggest regret is is that all of the talented people and all of the talent that was around here that came through these doors and uh, same thing with a lot of other in the, uh, independent retail that got involved with artists, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and we couldn't help them and stuff. It's like, man, it, it's, it's some, it was, you know, some real dope kids and stuff that we got a chance. And it's amazing because we got a chance to do well with a lot of them overseas, Japan, France, Germany. Uh, but because here we couldn't get no radio play here. There was no social media, uh, couldn't go do shows, couldn't, couldn't go perform in Inglewood or Pasadena because of the gang situation. And, uh, you know, it was just, so it's just a lot of them aged out or just got tired of trying and stuff. But, man, it's, my biggest regret is that uh, I didn't push harder. I pushed, but maybe I should have pushed harder to get a situation with uh, Def Jam or Interscope or, uh, Arista, uh, you know, because I used to, uh, I was a part of a lot of their marketing and strategy program and stuff. I used to fly to New York just to listen to Def Jam new release schedule, uh, mm. you know, and talk about how, you know, how we're going to push it and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I knew Lior and Russell well and stuff, but I couldn't get up. <laughs> I can't get a production deal with them cats and stuff, man. But it had I got in there. I had my brother Cletus got in there uh, when we were really trying to uh, get something going. 
it 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 would have been a different game and stuff, man. Because uh, you know, brilliant mind, brilliant, you know, marketing strategies, uh, and it, and and the whole situation would have been a lot better and stuff, you know, uh, you know, and and I I know for a fact, man. I I I literally, I literally tried to save myself. Now we used to have um, meetings with the majors and stuff, and one of the meetings we used to have every year was the Norm Convention, uh, and the Norm Convention was the biggest convention because that was the only convention that the heavy, heavy, heavy weights at all of the record companies. You talking about the record company owners attend that, and I remember right. seeing when the, when things had got real bad. I said, "Look, man," I said, uh, uh, "I'm not." Uh, I'm, you know, we got to do something about what a lot of artists are saying on their record and stuff. I said, because you got to understand that what you say on your record can kill you. I said, yeah. and they yeah, look at yeah. me like, you know, they look at me like I'm crazy and stuff. And it's like, you know, I mean, it wasn't even discussed and stuff. But uh, I also remember this. I also remember being at Death Jam one day. And that's when big screen TVs first came out, you know. <laughs> no, you know that was probably the first one that I actually seen in person was up in Def Jam office. But I was at Def Jam one day, and they had, uh, uh, you know, it was, you know, it came up to hear their new releases and stuff. So they set me in front of this big screen TV, and they uh, played. Uh, play this video and then I noticed them watching me watch the video and stuff. So I said, mm, okay. So when the video went off, they said, well, what do you think of it and stuff? I said, oh, wow. I said, it was well produced and stuff. And you just probably sell a few records. I said, but it's a shame somebody's going to die behind it. And they said, die behind it? What you talking about? I'm like, man, I told y'all, man, that game banging on the West Coast is real, man. It ain't no joke. I mean, this ain't, right. you know, so the video was uh, a BG knockout and Gangsta Dre dog pound killers was the video. <laughs> and if you're not familiar with it, you can, you can pull it up. Uh, and now check this out. Now, uh-huh. about a month later after that, uh, here comes Def Jam. Def Jam come to town, go rent this golf course out in Malibu, $50,000 a day golf course to shoot a Montel Ooh. Jordan video. So what do Def Jam do? Def Jam invited uh, all their artists to come hang out. So so they invited Warren G. And so who did Warren invite? He invited about. the dog is this when, and stuff. Is this, is, this when the, yeah. is this when the infamous fight broke out? Yep, 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 <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Said, oh, and, <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's it. That's and, and, and what was it behind? It was behind the dog on video, dog pound yeah. killers and stuff. So that's when uh, Nate hit uh, one one of the uh, well, the, who was it? Dre or uh, BG knockout? One of me hit with the golf club. club. Yeah, yeah. Now he 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 didn't die, but he could have easily right. and stuff. And so you know, I'm like, and then you know when. Tupac may hit him up. I'm like that. That ain't that's that's not good. And so, and then even after all of that, when when Biggie got killed, now after the uh, BET Awards that night, uh, mm-hmm. Bad Boy had they list had they uh, uh, after party at the House of Blues. So we at the right. House of Blues that. At the bad boy party, and and, and Big and Puffy is walking around like they're in Brooklyn. I'm like, I told my rep that night. I said, "Look, man, this is not good." I said, uh, "They shouldn't be walking around like this." I said, uh, "Like they're in Brooklyn." I said, "Pac is dead, Sugar's in jail, and every 15 minutes the radio is playing. I don't know the name of the song Puffy had, but I know the lyrics was." Can't nobody stop me now. Can't nobody hold me back. Yeah, can't nobody hold me down. Nah. Can't, nobody, can't nobody hold me down. Yeah. Right. Okay, so, I mean, this was being played every 15 minutes. I'm like, this ain't even a call that should have to make uh, or, or, or would need to make. I'm like, there's a lot of people out here 
would 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 love to get a feather in their cap for putting a bullet in one of these guys. So I'm like, you know, I, I, I was concerned about them being out here from that point on and stuff. And so when I got a call the next night or uh, the next two nights uh, that Big had been killed, I wasn't surprised. And stuff. So, and what it was about, you know, it's about what 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 you're saying on your record. So. My thing, a lot, I work with a lot of local artists and stuff, and like I say, you can talk about your family, your hood, your school, but you can't talk about nobody else. I'm just sorry. I'm just not having it and stuff. So, now, did you see, uh, yeah. Now, did you see when a lot of these records, like these disc records start coming out, did you see a, a, like a huge – Boost in sales when it comes to that. Like a lot of people were buying it out your stores. Like because they at the time they used to release like maxi singles. Right, right. Well, yeah. I mean, it did create a boost in sales. <laughs> yeah, it did. But it also got people riled up to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it it created a, a boost times, in sales. Yeah, because a lot of times too, you know, really, which and I'm so glad, you know, it's been 20 years now since they really resolved it. Um, the yeah. issue between MC8 and DJ Quick, which was really a misunderstanding. Um, right. But it was, uh, oh, it and that happens like a, way too often. Yeah. Right. Wrong information get put out there, and then, you know, the fire starting, you can't put it out. That's Yeah. I've seen some stuff yeah. go <clears throat> real bad, real fast on a misunderstanding. Yeah, I mean, you know, me and King were just, we, we we knew this was going to be good. We 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 didn't expect to get this level of legendary greatness. Already, this is going to go down as one of our greatest shows ever. Oh, um, oh man! Be, because uh, top three already. You know, <laughs> we're not even at ten o'clock yet, and we're already like one of the top three greatest shows we've ever done. Because Mr. Anderson, you. I got to break this down before we go further. Number one, you 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 are a record store owner, independent, so you're doing you you know you and your family are doing this on your own hustle at the time, and you're actually having label meetings with the top brass. You're sitting with Lior and Russell. I mean, they actually your clout is like on a cosmic level of boss status. I mean, um. I mean, you're really sitting down with the with the decision makers, the people who decide budgets. Um, you know, you're seeing yeah. all of these things as they progress. Um, uh, when you when the whole situation with Biggie and Pop really kind of started to kind of catch fire in the worst way, um, the flashpoint moment, and we're not even getting to the part about. Because a lot of people know about the infamous fight on the golf course in Malibu. We know about it. Right. We didn't know how it started. You just basically oh, wow. like gave That's all of exactly our history. How it history. <laughs> you just gave us a exactly. history lesson on how the, exactly on how this whole thing happened. Yeah. Um, Pull up the video and the, watch it. You'll see why it happened. Yeah. The 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 1995 <laughs> Source Awards where uh where Shug you know, makes his infamous state, you know, statement, you know, y'all don't want to have a producer all up in the videos dancing, <laughs> come to death row. Oh, yeah. You know, you um, you what was are. that like? On, yeah, what was that like on the West Coast for y'all when y'all saw that? Well, we, 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 but, you know, death row days, man, it's like, I, I saw so much stuff uh that I just you know did not believe uh what would happen but you know it it, it didn't get no realer than death row. I'm telling mm-hmm. you. I saw I saw some stuff that happened uh at some of the uh conventions like the uh uh the uh, uh what was it used to be Jack the Rapper convention. In Miami, and, yes sir. Uh, Urban Network Convention. I think we was in. Were we in Miami? I think we might have been in Atlanta. Jack the Rapper. Uh, uh, when uh, it was one convention that uh, that uh, 
Ray couldn't come to because of the situation with him and D. So he was like, he he couldn't leave the city, so he he couldn't come down. He couldn't come to the convention, and uh, right. Jeff Jeff Rowe had a big uh, showcase at the convention, and so I remember being in there. And I was backstage, and I actually met Chu for the first time in person there at the convention. Luke introduced me to him. You know, he shook my hand. I never, you know, I won't ever forget the massive handshake. <laughs> so, and so he said, yeah, I heard a lot about you and stuff. When we get back to the city and stuff, we got to get together and chop it up, you know, because he was in motion. So, uh mm-hmm. So uh, they was getting ready for their showcase, the Death Row Showcase. So I'm there, and uh, uh, I'm there, and we backstage uh, getting ready to set up to do the show. And so sure, well, on stage, he said, hey, he said, there's, there's too many people on stage. He said, some of y'all are going to have to get off stage. Okay, so nobody moved. So he walked up, and he pointed out three people. He said, hey. I want you, you, and you to get off the stage. And so it's just kind of even about big as sugar stuff. He just kind of lifted his shoulder and he said, you know me? And no sooner he did that, sugar just clocked him. And, and I'm like, I'm looking at this, I'm like, damn. And he turned around and went on by this business like nothing. I'm like, damn. You know, I'm like, like that? And then the next thing he did was he got up and he told everybody in the, in the particular fact, he said, now, he said, uh, if you're in here and you got any kind of recording device or cell phone, we gonna, I'm going to give you all 10 minutes to get them out of here. Because uh, if not, they're going to belong to death row. And he said, he said, I want you all to know that death row is in the house and we will roll you all motherfucking ass up. Now, to be... <laughs> I'm like, did he just say that? So I'm like, you know, we had a convention. His, his gangster there from Chicago. His gangster there from Florida. I mean, his gangster there from everywhere. So I'm like, damn. Man, let me find me a safe place to stand. But uh, that's just how they move, man. That that shit was real and stuff. I, yeah, I, I never went, you know, it, it's nothing, you know, gang about me. Himself. And like I say, I understood between more situations, uh, y'all, uh, I understood between Crips on Crips, so Crips and Bloods, uh, uh, Crips and, 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 and Mexican gangs and stuff. So my, my thing is to try to defuse stuff. Even a lot of time, I know who was in the wrong. But I just also mm-hmm. know that either somebody's going to end up dead or somebody's going to end up in prison for a long time. So if there's a possible way of figuring this out without all of that, you know, I try to work towards that. But, yeah, I mean, a lot of times, you know, people have been, it does been situations where people need to be dealt with, but it was going to result in somebody dead or somebody in prison for a long time. So I, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up a Martin Luther King type baby and stuff, you know. I got a lot of Malcolm in me. <laughs> but yeah. you know, people that know me would say, you know, you know, he's a he's a Malcolm he's a Martin baby. So if I yeah, can man. you know, if I can save a life or whatever and stuff, man, I'm all for that because, you know, something something can get worked out. Definitely. Now you're talking about now taking it back a bit, uh, Kelvin. When we're talking about working it out, of course, Rolling Twenties are heavy out in Long Beach. The uh, the Bloods right. and Crips album Banging on Wax released March 10th, 1993. How monumental was that? Because it involved a lot of sets from all over. Um, you know, shout out to OG Senlo. You know, Danny Girl. Mm-hmm. Rest in peace to uh, Nene X, a.k.a. Bloody Mary. Of course, Blue Rag. Right. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, what was that like What was that like for that uh, when that record came together? And um, what, was the, what was the feeling around L.A. during that time after April 29th, you know, with the acquittal of the four officers in the Rodney King beating? Right. Um, and right. then the gang's yeah. coming to bed. What was that like? <laughs> Go ahead. 
yeah, I mean that was that was a, a real tough time and stuff. It was it was kind of hard, you know. I I remember I was actually uh, the night of the uh, Rodney King verdict. I was in L.A. at a meeting mm-hmm. uh, in West L.A. and so uh, you know it, it was a TV on in the building, and someone came in and said, hey, you guys need to come look at this and stuff. So we came in the news, and it was a looting. It was probably around 6 o'clock in the evening, and the looting had started, and the fires, and the, and it, it was just, it was crazy. And uh, so we canceled the meeting. I went outside. They was raiding the gas station across the street from where I was, from where the meeting was, and then I finally made my way to the uh 110 freeway and parts of the and it was like uh just dark and it was mm. like the freeway was kind of elevated so you could see a distance and you could see fires everywhere from the freeway just fires going so made it home uh you know with tv on uh so it wasn't a lot happening in residential area but you know businesses was getting hit up real bad which uh uh in the in the inner city of LA now it spread it to the outer city. It didn't get to Long Beach until the following day. It's when they looted mm-hmm. everything around here. Uh it was, it was crazy that evening. Well it the looting started in Long Beach around one PM the following day. And so I actually saw the big old crowd of mob of people coming down the street. So they hit the liquor store across the street, the shopping center across the other corner. And so I just started closing up. And so uh, uh, somebody came up to the door and said, uh, you know, why are you closing and stuff? I'm like, yeah, right. So they said, oh, man, ain't nobody going to touch a VIP. And, and that was, you know, that was a VIP has basically been protected by the neighborhood. Uh, I can say almost 42 years because we've been on the block in uh, June would be 42 years on the block. Man. So, uh, and and no incident. Nobody never got stabbed or shot at VIP. And and it's been some tense situations here sometimes with uh, in-stores that we've had. We had midnight sales, the midnight sale for doggy style. We had uh, big yeah. in stores uh, with big big in stores with LL during a time when LL and Warren was kind of not on good <laughs> good terms and stuff. So uh, and then the uh, the Nate Dog uh, Memorial that we did, we actually did two on the parking lot uh, for Nate Dog, mm-hmm. and that was at night time, and you had everybody here, Crips, Bloods, uh, you know, everybody Probably was here. Everybody. And yeah, everybody, Longo, everybody, and it was as you peaceful as, yeah. as as church. It was as peaceful as church and stuff. And you know, mm-hmm. I, I thank God that uh, it's like a lot of these guys, man. It's like you know, they, I guess they really see something in me as far as you know, uh, what I'm truly try to see, man manifest here in this area and stuff because, you know, I, I have I've had no problems here. <laughs> and 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 my store is in the center of the hood and stuff. It don't get no hooded than T C H Mar King. And Big Mass was gonna bring up about that time where you start seeing big records really popping off and People don't understand that even though Snoop Dogg is a star now, they don't realize how monumental he really was around the time from we heard him in the chronic to Dog Right, style. right. Like right, well, kids, see, it, 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 it's one thing about when we did, and, 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 I, and I just found something that I've been looking for for over 20 years, and I just found the original Snoop Dogg demo tape that we did, that I shot to all of the labels who turned it down. And it, it, was, it was crazy. That was probably one of the most disgusting times in my life because uh, when I shot this demo, Snoop, this 213 demo to 
yeah. all of these labels that I that I know the Def Jam, the Jive, the the Interscope, uh, all of them. I, I shot the demo, and when I talk to uh, you know the you know A and R director and stuff like that, I'm like I'm like this kid ain't just the best rapper in Long Beach. Uh, L.A. or the West Coast. I said, I don't know nobody better than this kid in the world. I said, now, what I do every day on a daily basis is I put music in the hand of the consumer so I know what what will sell instantly or down the line. Oh, I know that because so, that's what I do. And, man, I got stuff like, uh, you know, uh, you know, he's okay, but not what we're looking at. Uh, John McClain, who ironically was head of uh, A&R director at Interscope at the time, and if you, I'm sure you know, if you don't know who John McClain is, he, his claim, first claim to fame was when he signed uh, Janet to A&M, I think, was one of his big signings. Right. But now he, he had Interscope. John McClain said that about Snoop, he said that I don't think that he has what it takes. So I spent uh, about two months trying to get that, you know, get them to uh, get a deal for them and stuff. And so fortunately, at the end of the situation is uh, Warren that took the uh, uh, cassette over to uh, this bachelor party or some kind of party that Dre was having, and Dre heard it. And he like, you know, who is this? And so Warren like, this is my homeboy Snoop Dogg. I've been trying to tell you that we got this group, 213. Well, uh, it, it says uh, in one of the documentaries that the next night, uh, Dre had Snoop in the studio working on 187 for the Deep Cover soundtrack. And that right. is the record that launched Snoop's career because after the success of 187, all of these same record companies like, Kelvin, you in Long Beach, who is this Snoop Doggy Dog guy? I'm like, actually A&R director and stuff because I was just too through that I couldn't get nobody. And then that's also something that I learned about record companies and stuff because the people that I was closest to at these different record companies were sales, marketing, promotion people. The A and R side of a company is totally different. <laughs> That's a totally different animal and stuff. So, uh, you know, and I, I remember a lot of time that you would have people from these labels here putting up displays in the store or dropping off stuff, and I'd be banging our stuff. And they like, man, I wish I was working that instead of this bullshit they got me out here working. <laughs> and I, you know, and, and 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 that was real and stuff because, like I say, man, we 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 have some heat and stuff. And I think that, uh, you know, it might not happen the way it did, but I think, uh, you know, had had uh, you know. I think Snoop's route to getting where he he is would have been probably easier. He probably would have had a lot more fun, uh, you know, than the route that he, he ended up taking and stuff. But, uh, you know, he's he's still the man. You yeah, know, still um, the man. It, when, I, when I think about that uh, 213 uh, album, you know, um, because, you know, um, I mean, for those of our listeners that don't know, 213 is also the area code as well. That's what Snoot, Nate Dogg, and Warren G, that's how they put it together. Um, It's hard to believe, you know, seeing the legendary status of where they all achieved. Of course, rest in peace to Nate. I remember his verse off of, you know, Keep It Gangsta, you know, when, um, you know, when he had his, when he had his verse, he said, my sister's cousins told me her sister heard some stories we were so gangster growing up. We got the girls excited, but offer to give their bodies, take them straight to the after party. Two homeboys in a closet grinding, ain't no fun that they can't hide it. I can't be faded. I'm a nigga from the motherfucking Trump type, and you can't deny it. <laughs> Fucked up everyone who's tried it. I remember when it started. Seems like yesterday morning, blame it on us. Yeah, we did it. 
Took hip hop and got gangster with it. It's that gangster music they adore. <laughs> oh man, that is my. He kicked yeah. yeah. they black on that, man. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, man. I mean, that brother was he? That man, that that brother. He, I mean, he had a, a great run for a good long time, and you know, it, the hook one master. thing about it, yeah, the hook master. And then it's like he could take the most gangsterous lyrics and 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 and, and put baby powder on it or something because you know. <laughs> <laughs> they say I got holes in different area codes. The women was like, "Hey, you know." So I mean, he could he could sing something and say "motherfucker," and it would sound soothing to the ear. So it was just amazing, you know, how he put his little, you know, twist on a, on on a project. Man, it was like, man, that brother. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, you know, and even like I said, this underground stuff, I mean, this demo stuff that I got on the original demo that uh, I don't know when I'm going to drop it, but, you know, Nate is all over this stuff, you know, singing hooks and, you know, Snoop God. is flowing. And how record companies passed on that back then, but like I say, most A&R departments, and that I, that I know was would know a hit if it slapped them upside the head and stuff. A lot of these deals was cut in the back office by the entertainment lawyers and stuff like that. Somebody had some clout mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So uh, you know, a, a, a lot of the big deals, you know, uh, uh, the they, they had connections. Uh, I feel because it's too many kids been was passed on. And uh, you know, I do want to come in about that Blood and Chris project now. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. We actually we actually did great with that and stuff. And then because they did a Blood and Crip album, and then they did it separate. They did a Blood one and a Crip one. Well, we yeah. of course we sold more Crip ones, but we actually sold both of them. Now I don't know how familiar you are with uh, are you familiar with the Rep You Set album? Rip? That was I've done by. Oh man, you gotta have that, man. You gotta have that. That that album was the same thing and it was done by uh man, what's the dude's name that passed away? The the, the brother who 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 put all that the original Bloods and Crips project and the it was on dangerous project. Music. It was released on dangerous right. music. Right. Um, now this 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 brother he did the Repcha Set project and it was the same thing man it was like uh, every hood represented and everybody I mean, these were all real ones these wasn't no studio gangsters these were all real ones and uh, the project was unbelievable I mean you, the the production sound like Dre did it and everybody from every hood that was on that could rap. And uh, and you know we actually did a uh, uh, in store here with like probably a lot, I think about like six six other artists from uh, from the project Bloods and Crip. Matter of fact, they even did a live performance here. Now for I'm thinking. Us. Now you said now you the gentleman that passed away. I'm thinking was it OG? Was it uh was it um At Will and Tweety Birdloke? Well, Tweety was with it, but the, the brother that was behind the whole project, they had, man. Oh, man, why? Okay. I can't think of his name. But somebody will listen to the other. Yeah, right. no, it, that ain't who it was. And, but he actually, okay, okay. Uh, after after the uh, Reptile Set project, he had a heart attack and died. And, mm. man, and so, of course, you know, when you, when you, when you take the head off and stuff, everything else dies. And right, man, I, right. I think that it was so many cats that participated on that project was headed toward a promising career and stuff. But after he died and stuff, everything just fell apart. And you know, some a couple of guys that been killed since then, a couple of you know, a few more than prison and stuff. But man, like I said, that that's a project that everybody should have a copy of. Rep your set and stuff, man. Every Every neighborhood was I mean, uh, pretty much represented on that. One thing about it, Kelvin, is um, I'm from Virginia, Hampton Road, South Side, two up, two down, born and raised. 
Eric is, uh, you know, King is from um, North Carolina. Um, we have always had love for the West Side, you know, all the way from the East Coast. And, I mean, one thing we were always just, just, just totally – uh, amazed at is the level of them seeing the, the, the these street niggas was like really I mean these guys were on an unbelievable level of them seeing in addition to their you know their gangster you know reputation I mean you know and, and I mean we're just seeing it today you know shout out to guys like BG Perico you know other affiliates you know out of Long Beach of course Crooked Eye Circle of Bosses Horseshoe Gang. I mean, you know, uh, I, I mean, these, and, I mean, we're looking at producers, you know, uh, of course, shout out to Battle Cat, you know. Um, oh, yeah. Um, of, you know, Crazy Tunes, rest in peace. You right, know, right. These are, guys who, these are guys who are really from the block who mastered the craft in hip-hop and production. I mean, what was it like watching these guys? You know, and a lot of these girls, you know, shout out to, like I said, Danny Girl, you know, Yo-Yo, you know, uh, oh, yeah. Knee High, yeah. you know, of, of of course, you know, right. um, you know, all, I mean, the Fem C's out there, of course, Il Camille still doing her thing today. I mean, what was it like watching all these artists out there come up? Oh, man, it was, it was amazing stuff, man. It was, like I say, uh, uh, you know, we, it's like, you know, 90s, 80s, 90s, you know, you didn't come out or you didn't come through VIP and stuff. So we were <laughs> always, you know, we we were always, uh, you know, uh, kept on, on, on notice on on releases, on listening parties, on, you know, uh, being a part of the, the, the launching of a lot of these projects and stuff. So, uh, you know, we, we just, just, kind of tuck it and run with it. We, matter of fact, uh, you know, it was like uh, now I feel like uh, a, a lot of the stuff that I that I did, that independent retailers did for so many years was it, it should have been a paid position <laughs> because right. uh, we did it. We did the heavy pushing and stuff when uh, and we, we saved a lot of, you know, saved a lot of people's jobs and stuff by just caring and just appreciating the music and the talent and stuff like that. Like I say, man, uh, I can keep nothing no secret, man. You let me hear something good, I'm telling everybody. And, you know, and that's the way our customers were, too. You know, I, I, I got to the point where you would come in my store and say, hey, man, I, I, I got a little road trip up in the drive to Phoenix and stuff. Just give me something to listen to. And, and I just... I, me knowing the customer, I'm like, okay, here, here, take this, this, and this. And they come back, oh, man, that was dope, man. Like, you know, so, uh, and I mean, these be independent projects and stuff. It's just even like right now, if I'm on a little road trip and stuff, that's what I'm grab my CD bag with some independent stuff that, you know, that I'm going to be listening to. Uh, classic independent stuff. Uh, uh, you I don't know if you know uh, OG Daddy V and stuff uh, mm-hmm. from Compton. He's a Compton mm-hmm. legend and stuff. He used to sell the mixtapes at the swap meet, but he also did a project uh, that is, is is one of my favorite projects. And, you know, you got, uh, I don't know if you know uh, this artist from Long Beach back in the day, uh, uh, Young Swoop, Swoop G. Yeah. Hey, look, 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 let me tell you something. Let, look, let me tell you something. Swoop should have been second only to Snoop Dogg, to me, mm-hmm. out of Long Beach, because of his lyrical skills and talent. But he 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 couldn't 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 he couldn't he couldn't handle money and stuff. It's a mm-hmm. lot of it's quite a few record companies tried to sign him and gave him that advance and stuff like that and. And next thing you know, he he done got wet out there and stuff, and none oh, oh, wrapped him and say just being around a pole or something, and you just couldn't do nothing with him and stuff. And it's like, but man, rap rapping skills, flows, oh man, I was, I, I still listen to some of his old stuff, but it, it's just like a lot of a lot of talents like that, man. I was just, it was just like I said, man, it's like a wealth 
of projects uh, that, you know, just people just don't know about. And that's the reason why, you know, today artists, it ain't never been a better time for for artists today because, you know, A&R, you know, back in the day was a picture, bio, and a demo. Shoot, mm-hmm. man, you can lay across your you can lay across your bed with your laptop and do the same thing they do up at <laughs> at the major labels now all around the world. So, uh, you know, so, and then, you know, if you get, get lucky and get something going with one of these social media platforms, it's on and cracking, man. So, uh, you know, the kids today, uh, man, it ain't, like I say, it ain't never been a better time for an artist. Uh, it's you know a few like a, it's still a few kids in the area that's doing good uh, overseas. I you know I would, would love to see this uh, situation with this virus you know change and get better because uh, of course you know it's a lot of money that's not being made because you can't gather and, and do shows and stuff like that. But uh, uh, you know that's a social media platform can keep people informed inform and stuff. So, uh, you know, they still got that little outlet of, uh, you know, keeping their music, people ears and popping. But, uh, yeah, yeah. we're we, we in, a, we in a, a, a whole different time <laughs> right now. So, I mean, even, you know, officially we've been closed since March. Uh, mm. They haven't given us the okay to reopen the store yet. So hopefully that'll be coming soon. But you know we still do other things. I mean, I mean that nineties era. I mean because one of the you know uh, for y'all having y'all presence in Long Beach, you already know. But the national exposure came, of course. You know, uh, Snoop Dogg's um, was it Snoop Dogg or Dr. Dre's uh, "Let Me Ride" video? I'm trying to think. Uh, but it was one of those well, that your store was actually. That, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the one that put us on the map. Yeah, the well, Snoop Dogg. What's my name? Yeah, what's your name? Yeah, what's my name? Yeah, yeah. yeah what's, the what's my name? That was the one that he shot. Uh, yeah, shot uh, portions of the video on the roof of the store. Yeah, because he was standing on. He was standing on top. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He shot a portion of what's my name. He actually uh, did three videos on the roof of the store. He did the what's my name video. He did uh, the uh, remake to Welcome to Atlanta remake. He did the Welcome to Long Beach remake Mm -hmm. uh, on the roof of the store. He definitely pulled that up on YouTube. And then he did uh, uh, the East Side of G'd Up uh video he they did on the roof of the store. So yeah. they did three yeah. on the roof. Old blooded too. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. The East Side yeah. of the project. You know, and uh it was uh when the project came out, I uh when I first saw the project, well now they sent me a copy of it. And I looked at the back of it and the VIP logo the VIP sign is on the back of the East Side of the Project. So they called me, and at that time I was uh, president of the Independent Retailers Association uh, on the West Coast. So uh, TVT called me and stuff and said that, uh, uh, you know, did you see the album cover? I was like, yeah. I'm like, you know, that's kind of risky putting my lab- putting my logo on the back of a uh cover that you're trying to sell in all these other stores and then they like yeah but we know who you are and we know what you do what you can do and we need you on this project we need you to make that phone call to you know all of the retail stores that you associated with and and help us you know make this debut east side of the project number one so, I mean, it was something that I was going to do anyway because, uh, they, these are my kids. But, uh, you know, the fact that they were going as far as putting the logo on the back of the east side of the project, that was big. And then yeah. come and shoot some of the video on the roof also. Yeah, that was big. 
I mean, but, you know, y'all got so many um, legends. I mean, not only, you know, musically, of course, you know, Willie McGinnis, shout out to Long Beach Poly, you know, where he went, went to USC. Oh, yeah. I mean, you you know, you all, you know, play for the Patriots and Browns, three-time <laughs> Super Bowl champion. I mean, you Right, know, right. Oh, yeah, and, and a terrific businessman. He owns several businesses out here. So, and, and plus what he's doing as an analyst on, on, yeah, on, on the sports network. channel. So. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, he he he's doing it, man. Yeah, he is definitely uh, doing it. You know, I mean, you, you know, it's you all have such a rich heritage in your city, man. I mean, um, and it's you know, I mean, to really be, you know, to really have your store kind of put in motion, you know, what we're really kind of um set the foundation for the West Coast movement in terms of really, because before the music comes, there has to be a place where it can actually, where people can come together and congregate, you know, and, you know, you predate, you know, all of these legends that would eventually, you know, come from it. I mean, um, that's one reason why we wanted to do this show with you, because we got to protect you and VIP at all costs. I mean, you know, you you guys are a hip hop treasure, you know, to the culture, right. and we, you know, I mean, uh, just in terms of where you see the marketing, uh, because your experience has just covered so many parameters of the business aspects to the marketing uh, to signing. Right. Um, what have you seen in terms of how? the music has changed in terms of where maybe uh, certain styles kind of became more prevalent where it wasn't the traditional sense of uh, hip hop as we grew up listening to, you know, um, where do you, where do you think the music has changed in terms of how it's been marketed and, you know, how artists are getting signed when they do take big labels? Cause we know about when a lot of these artists now in the social media age are doing them from a independent level, which is great. Uh, but in terms right. of how, what's the paradigm now in terms of how labels are signing artists and how the music is kind of not what it once was? Right. Well, definitely, it's it, it, it's it's been a, you know, it's been a big change in 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 the way music is is you know introduced and you know A and R record company now is is all about. Uh, your numbers, uh, mm-hmm. you know, if, uh, uh, you know, it ain't, uh, uh, you could go into a and r session and, and, and play play your music and, and they can love it. But when they research you online and social media and see that you don't exist and stuff, they're just not interested. They just, it's, right. all, it's all about, it's a numbers game and stuff, you uh, I, I know a few people that have blowed up. I mean, really blowed up on TikTok, <laughs> you know, and other social media platforms. Well, they they you know it was just a, a lucky break, and, and but the record company they didn't really care anything about the the project or the or the song and stuff, but the numbers. So. It's just a numbers game now, and you know I've I've heard some projects that man I'm like man, you know this 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 is a great project, but unfortunately for you is I know it and you know it. If you can't get it out to the masses of people, it, it don't mean anything and stuff. So uh, to me, uh, uh, the perfect. Uh, situation for uh, someone trying to start the only record company now uh, is that they got to have uh, the strongest point of their company got to be their social media team mm-hmm. posting, posting, posting. I remember, like I said, my nephew Absol before he even was signed, and I remember because he worked at one of the stores, uh, and uh, I would stop by the store, and he would be in there online, and he was like, uh, excuse me, Uncle, I'll be right with you and stuff. I'm wrapping up this interview. <laughs> and he'd be doing interviews overseas and stuff. I mean, he just kept, you know, 
his name and, and his little projects. Uh, you're doing social media posts all over the world and stuff. So that's what you need. You know, you it's, it's, you know, I've always said that I would rather have uh, a mediocre project and great marketing than a great market than a great project and mediocre marketing. It's all about the marketing. It's uh, it's all about the impression. That's when I said that. You know, there used to be. I mean, a lot of times. Uh, uh, People wouldn't bite on projects the first week, second week, the third week, but by the fifth week they they buying it. That's great marketing and stuff. So, you know, you and and, to, and today and and there's so much music out there now. It because it's like, you know, when we when we were open, most of the music that people was walking in and asking about or inquiring about wasn't something that they heard on the radio. So right. You know, yeah. So it's the the game done. You know, really changed and stuff. And you know, even as far as like, uh, you know, here at VIP when we open, we probably got a few customers that's like looking for music. Uh, mostly the uh, old school music. Uh, it's the uh, uh, fifth and older music crowd. Uh, most of the young people come through buying gear, you know, T-shirts, hoodies, caps, picking up a few other items. We'll probably try to start carrying like a line of tennis shoes. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do here now is that uh, uh, the historical uh, uh, world-famous VIP record sign is, okay. is actually I took it down like about two years ago because we wasn't in that particular building any longer, and uh, uh, I did make this sign of uh, 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 approve and apply for a historical status for the sign. Yeah. that did do it is confirmed. Yeah. His, yeah, yeah. It's so a now it's a historical uh, landmark. It is a, an official historic landmark, and we. Uh, uh, but uh, I wasn't able to get the original building back. Uh, we actually have moved a couple of times within the same strip mall, so the same mm-hmm. block but different building. So uh, when, when I decided to make the sign of historic landmark, uh, we tried to get the original building back and wasn't able to get it because mm-hmm. uh, 7-Eleven, who had applied for the building, thought the sign was a historic landmark and uh, couldn't be moved, but I told him that wasn't the case. So I told him if I didn't get the building back, the sign was coming down. And so I did take it down. I have the sign in storage now. Uh, I did have hopes for one day opening a black music museum and, uh, you know, to show the history. You know, I I wanted to show everything from the 8-track tape to... (laughs) <laughs> to uh, to the digital platform today and uh, create an atmosphere that you could come in and learn the history of music, so, you know, the way we sold it, the way we marketed it, the whole nine and stuff. And I think it would have been a real interesting place for the entire family to come and see. So don't think that that's going to happen now, but what I do want to create is a VIP experience that would also have a lot of those elements, and so I'm going to be working on that. Uh, I was I was in hope that I would be deep off into that this year, but because of the uh, coronavirus situation, everything has been shut down and put on hold. Look, if they so, can make a trap, uh, if they can have a trap museum. You can have that. (laughs) I mean, I mean, there is so much history that needs to be told. I mean, we're we're like, it's, we're 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 just like honored that we got all of this. It's like I I don't think anybody else has ever gotten it like we've gotten this. (laughs) I, I mean, this is. This is historic right here in terms of you being the curator and uh, just representing the culture. I mean, and, and, you know, 
you know, we, you know, King and myself, we've interviewed so many different artists from California that we, you know, that we call the Young California Movement. You know, shout out to Angela right. Donna, you know, Honest Long, you know, represent Pomona's daughter of cocaine, you know, the legendary Jerry Long. Of course, you know, shout out to Compton with Compton AV, you know, shout oh, out yeah. to BG, PG Perico, shout out Broadway Gangster Crip. You know, uh, with So Way Out Entertainment, shout out to AD, you know, doing his thing right. out in Compton. You know, shout out to Don Sizzle, right. you know, uh, of One West Magazine. You know, so many, I mean, of course, taking it up to the Bay Area, you go, you got the 916, oh, you yeah. got Mozzie in Sacramento. I mean, you know, Jay Stalin, you know, Livewire, you know, right. shout out to the 707, you know, 209, you know, 510. You know, four one five. You know, it's. I mean, up and down Cali, y'all have kept it active, man. I mean, what defines that California hustle for all of you? That just you all just stay so consistent, putting out dope product. <laughs> and, and and really, it's something because uh, so much of it is never heard. So much of it is is you know. Is, is just lost, and you know it's like I say, it's so many, so many people that have retired from the game and that never got that shot. That you know, had I been in, put into the right situation, uh, if I had the right opportunity, they definitely would have gotten it. You know, uh, I mean, and and not only uh, uh, rappers and stuff, uh, R and B singers. Uh, jazz musicians, uh, gospel singers, reggae artists. Man, I'm like, you know, I, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I I'm kind of a pat rat. I don't throw nothing away. And I was digging in through demos from the early 90s that was dropped off mm-hmm. here. And it was like, man, some of the amazing stuff. Uh, man, I have no idea what those people are today. But uh, yeah, it's just so so much uh, good talent waste and stuff, you know. And uh, yes. something that uh, I would never live down. Uh, the fact that you know a lot of people that deserve the shot never really got the shot. Uh, I mean, yeah. You know, some of them are doubling what... back down on social media and getting a little traction, but you know it's. A lot of them don't don't have it in the heart as like they did. <laughs> and you know, Kelvin, one thing about the industry, you know, it can take a lot out of you in terms of what you put into oh, yeah. it. You oh, know, yeah. uh, and, and of and of course, I and of course, I was shouting everybody out. I can't forget my homies out in the six one nine Southeast San Diego stand up, wrong kind of records, Lincoln Park. We see y'all out there. You know, um, you know, shout out to CJ, Mitchie Slick, you know, Oso Ocean, you know, Meat Face, um, you know, EC Blood, you know, all the, you know, whole wrong kind of click, man, you know, my homies. Oh, yeah. yeah, man, but I mean, you know, it's so much that goes on in the industry. Um, the politics of it have been so dirty in terms of what, you know, what do what do people really have to understand in terms of how, you know, you really have to be ready for it once you get in in terms of how your music is marketed? Because like you said, you're having individuals like when, you know, Inspector Deck said, uh, well, Genius said on Wu-Tang's Protect Your Neck, first of all, who's your A&R? I'm a climber who plays like electric guitar, but he don't even mean enough dope when he's looking for a suit and tie wrap that's cleaner than a bar So, You know, um, what I mean, just what do artists have to understand about how the industry really, really works in terms of once you get your foot in the door with it? Well, you know, one one of the things is, and I, I even look at the early days on what happened with uh, some of the artists, some of the main fallout. The main fallout early days was definitely over the money and stuff. And it's like I, I look at Snoop and Warren's situation. Now, Snoop was at death row and won that death jam. Snoop mm-hmm. either generated more money, but it was at a point in time where Warren made more money because uh, 
Warren has a better deal, meaning that, uh, you know, it, no matter what they give you up front, they recouping that, you know, so they're hoping you sell so they can recoup. So, right. uh, you know, it, it was like a lot of, you know, death, I'm sure death row charge, uh, 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 Probably even more <laughs> than it calls for limos, hotels, and stuff like that and stuff. So one of the things that Warren's uh, uh, manager when he was signing the Death Jam was his uncle Ron G. And so mm-hmm. uh, actually, uh, Ron had asked me to go with them to uh, this meeting uh, with Death Jam, and but I, I had a previous engagement and couldn't go. But I told him, I said, look, man, I said, if you guys end up, uh, if you guys end up, uh, you know, coming to some type of uh, a deal, I said, well, you know, a few of the things that you got to look out for is that, uh, you know, first of all, if they sign him, they can't get him a car. They can't get him an apartment. Uh, they can't, uh, uh you know, they have to pay him, let him get his own stuff in his name. I said, uh, and then they, you want to have some say so, uh, uh, be, uh, let you have to know up front about money spending your behalf, marketing, promotion, mm-hmm. money, and stuff. I said, because, you know, if you get paid every quarter, you know, and in three months, you be looking for a big check, and you be you end up getting a big statement of a uh, financial statement on what they spent in your behalf. Because right. one thing about a record company, they will spend all of your money. They gonna keep theirs, but they will <laughs> spend all of yours. And I remember mm-hmm. what was it, TLC or Salt and Pepper that was that yeah, went we off about, about yeah, the fact about that they had a, a a you know had a gold record and broke. And so the label saying, well, it ain't our fault that, you know, you, you want to stay in the rich hotel and, you know, you guys want separate limos and stuff like that. We gave y'all what y'all wanted for. In your contract, it says 100% recoupable. <laughs> so, yep. You know, it was like, you know, the, 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 the stick on the window would say, you know, this car is 40000 and, uh, you know, the label get it for uh, thirty-two thousand. Well, well, well they gonna charge yeah. you forty. <laughs> they gonna charge you what the sticker said, and so. That's and then you know, uh, you. so much, so much, so much stuff back then was trumped up. Music videos, man. Come on now. I remember uh, being at a meeting at RCA Records one time, and my rep he he got to the meeting late. He said he had just came from a, a photo shoot for one of the artists mm-hmm. and um, he says that it was a photo, it was a thirty thousand dollar photo shoot. Not video, photo. Come on now. Yeah. I mean, somebody was getting paid. So yeah. a lot of people oh man, it's like it's amazing how much money was being generated, you know, in this business before the crash and stuff. And and it was like nineteen. I, one of the one thing that I would never forget is that I remember being at a convention in two thousand, the year two thousand, one of the big major conventions. And every record company was that was there. I think it was like in March or April. They got mm-hmm. up and announced that nineteen ninety nine was the best year ever on record for their company. One after another got up there. <laughs> and, and when we think about the, it, yeah. and look and the meet and the meeting and, and and the meeting in two thousand and one, they said that two thousand was the worst year ever. And 2001 Damn. was worse than that. And 2002 was worse than that. So because of that, um, uh, uh, they had lost grip. You know, they had lost grip on the on the industry. And uh, you got people got out and all in the street, and they ain't even mixed it down yet and stuff. So 
the internet that came in and started killing off Napster. This yeah, with business. Napster. Yeah, 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 yeah. Napster came in, and you know mm-hmm. they what had happened was see the industry as you, you everybody probably know the industry should have embraced it and tried to work with it, but they said it was something that's just gonna pass away. You know, right. it wasn't gonna last and stuff. So uh, yeah, but when you got pop artists and stuff with these very expensive projects and and I remember one uh uh head guy one of the labels and stuff said that uh he was uh, he had came home one night and his son was playing music on a project that they were just finishing up on and stuff and it got leaked to the internet or something and he had a copy of it he almost died and stuff, but that, that was, you know, that's the reality was of what was happening. And, you know, it, it, a lot of stuff that I saw coming and a lot of stuff that had started happening during that time was happening at first, like with the chain stores and stuff, because, uh, you know, white kids started downloading music way sooner than black kids and stuff. So they felt the effect before we did, but it wasn't long after that and stuff until, you know, if you didn't have a CD burner, you knew somebody that had one. <laughs> so right, right. kids was hustling at the high school, the junior high school. At that time, I have, <laughs> my son was in uh, my son was in high school at Polly across the street, and uh, he, he he would come after school. He said, he said, Dad, I don't see how you selling any music and stuff because Half of the kids over there got backpacks full of burnt CDs and stuff. So, you know, it all so took, how you took guys a toll able to and adapt? stuff. Huh? How were you guys able to adapt through that period? Because a lot of mom and well, pop uh, well, going under. Yeah, well, no. See, that's just it and stuff. But, see, we always, and, and like, we, we during that time, we had 12 locations. Well, this location is the only one that still exists. And, you know, all of the other ones are closed. And like me, I, uh, you know, I thought, I guess one of the first things that that we did here is that, well, we always had a DJ service. So we did like a lot of gigs and stuff. And um, one of the things uh, we used to have services, whereas uh, we would uh, transfer VHS to DVD, uh, you could bring in your uh, uh, cassettes and have them transferred to a CD, uh, your vinyl to CD. Oh, man. We just had different services. We got, had different hustles and stuff. We we sold, you, you know, your T-shirts, your pro clubs and stuff like that, and, and we sold, uh, you know, a lot of other T-shirts. So we, we, we had a little hustle about us, but I mean, we wasn't, like, making money. I mean, we were surviving and stuff. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, we hold the world record for being on life support and stuff, you know. So, you know, VIP, um, VIP has existed because we 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 know how to breathe in, in high attitude, at, at, you know, attitude. You know, and it's wild, man, um, you know, because it's, you know, because, uh, you know, it's funny because there are two questions I want to ask you. What was it like, especially with mm-hmm. Def Jam on the West Coast? Because, of course, shout out to Cali Pitts, Big Prodigy, you know, Havoc, you know, uh, South Central Cartel, because, of course, they were the first, you know, West Coast group to be signed to Def Jam Records. You know, they were released their 1994 in Gas We Trust. Of course, you know, Boss, you know, she was on, you know, Def Jam West. You know, um, you know, of course, we, you know, Uncle Rich, you know, Richie Rich, he would be signed to Def Jam, you know, uh, J.O. Felony, you know, I mean, what was that Def Jam connection yep. like at the West Coast during that time? And, of course, in Warren G., well, you know, Warren G., of course, he, they say Warren G. Well, actually yeah. saved Def Jam in terms of well, when they yeah. signed him. Yeah, yeah, he, and, 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 and that is true, he. He did. I mean, I heard uh, in one of the little documentary pieces, I heard uh, 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 Russell say Warren Sado. And but what happened with you know, 
the Death Jam West thing, I remember, <laughs> you know, like I said, I was trying to get a label deal or a production deal with uh, mm-hmm. with Death Jam. They just were not hearing it. I remember one day when uh, actually me and Lior was uh, in the car together. I picked him up, uh, I was taking him uh, somewhere. And so he's like, man, we got to start this Death Jam West thing and stuff. We just... We need somebody. We need somebody that could run it and stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm raising my hand, you know, both hands waving <laughs> and stuff, you know. So this asshole said, uh, you know, I'm like, man, you know, I'm right here and stuff, you know. Oh uh, shit, you know, uh, sleep, you know, all of this came out of the VIP camp and stuff, you know. Uh, we need somebody who can control his people. We need somebody. Uh, like a Shug Knight type person. I'm like, you need somebody that you're going to be scared of? <laughs> I'm like, that don't make no sense. And so I'm like, so I'm like, man, you know, yeah, so, uh, and, and the most that I, I know, you know, they assigned, uh, they assigned, signed a Doug Fee for a minute. Yeah, Jim Fee. And the most that they did for Doug Fee is when I called up there and got on them about they wasn't doing anything, you know, to promote the project. And they, after that, they did a couple, couple, of, couple of campaign and stuff. But they just didn't know how to treat West Coast artists and stuff. I mean, the whole war situation was was, was, was different. And stuff. So, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I had that Dub C album, Ghetto Heisman. It was released in 2002. I had that record. It yeah. was dope. You know, uh, you know, of course, you know, Dove started his career with low profile, you know, before he went to Dove C in the Mass Circle. You know, all the projects were banging. I mean, one thing I remember, the track they had, the track they, um, the two tracks that really stand out from that era was Fucking Up the House Party and Dress Code. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, but yeah, man. Um, but also, too, we wanted to ask you about especially with physical copies, how important is that for the physicals? Because I go on eBay from time to time, and I look at some of those old West Coast. I'm looking at some of these West Coast albums from y'all. Dude, do you realize, Mm -hmm. Mr. Anderson, do you realize how much the Bloods and Crips album is going for on cassette right now on eBay? Oh, oh, yeah. I I look at some of that stuff from time to time. I was like, uh, $200. I'm like, yo. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, yeah. how important is it for physicals to still be a tangible commodity in the hip hop culture in terms of really having that album in your hand? Uh, can you hear me? King, we got him? Yeah, hold on one second. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm sorry okay, we about hear you. That. Yeah, we hear. No, we good. No, we hear you. You good? You good? Yeah, yeah. How much? Uh, yeah. How important is it for those physical copies to still be uh, circulated in the community of hip hop? Because some of that stuff is like, you know, a lot of that stuff's been. Some of that stuff's out of print now, and it's like, you know, I mean, it's just hard to find. Yeah. Well. Yeah, the physical copy is is is, is non-existent. Uh, uh, you know, artists come by here and they, you know, they ask me, uh, you know, uh, I listen to their projects. They ask me, should they make a physical uh, CD? Uh, I tell them, of course you should. I said, because uh, you don't need that. I, I wouldn't make them to put in stores, or, uh, but it should be a part of your package. Because if somebody, right. if somebody would... Uh, uh, if somebody would come in and if they like you, they'll buy your cap, your T-shirt, and they'll buy your CD. And you can right. probably even sell it for more. So physical music should be a part of your package as an artist, uh, but I wouldn't make it for, like, distribution uh, unless it become it go viral. Then, you know, you can put it in a few places, and then I would work out a deal with one of the existing chain stores that I can deal with just this particular chain and put it out there. Uh, but right. yeah, uh, physical product is 
is is is still you know is worth having. But like I say, so so much of it is online, and you, you're able to mail it to uh, 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 you know it's just like a few cats and stuff. I'm working out a situation now where I'm gonna do they hats and t-shirts. All they gotta do is promote it, and uh, we will ship it out for them, uh, collect them, and do the split. You know, uh, and so we would do that same thing for their CD. So people that if they like you, they will buy everything that you got. You know, so, uh, yeah, I would say any artist that I'm working with, I recommend that they make a physical physical CD. One of the things that I'm telling you, and this is regarding Mm -hmm. to the topic of physicals. Now, how was able, and, you know, we live in an age where it's hard to sell physicals in a lot of ways depending on the artist. Did you guys carry Nipsey Hussle's Crenshaw album? Uh, I did get the Crenshaw. Uh, I got the albums that we had were probably like the first three. The first three that his brother used to actually bring them to us. Uh, Shout out to Black the, Sam. Um, yeah, yeah, man, yeah, man. I, I need to talk to that brother, man. That 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 really uh uh that that hurted me, man, real bad. Because I mean, we and not only me, a lot of people have been singing Nipsey's praises and stuff because of his work, his commitment. Uh, he never said this to me, but the way that I saw him move was that it seemed like. Every time he made five dollars, he gonna put a dollar back in the community, and it seemed like that was a commitment that he had made to himself, and that was kind of the way, you know, that's that's the way he kind of moved to me and stuff was uh, always, uh, you know, staying involved in, in in you know in his community and stuff. So, uh, and then you know we had been that was just part of the saying around here, you know, more cats should be like nips. So that yeah. that was a shocker. Yes. Yeah. That was a shocker. You know, that was, you oh, no. know, um, and, and for King and myself, you know, that really hurt because uh, I'm a hip-hop nerd. I have every Source magazine since 1994. I have every Double XL since they started pressing in 1997. So I saw Nipsey and Double XL from when he first started, like I believe it was in 2003, 2004, they first profiled him. And I had the 2009 freshman issue when he was on the cover of it, you know, with so many other artists. So it's like to see Nipsey in terms of what he was doing coming along. I mean, I was just so happy, you know, when he released Victory Lap a couple of years ago. I was like, you know, because, you know, Nipsey had already done so much music prior to, you know, Bullets Ain't Got No Names, Slauson Boy, one and two, you know, the Crenshaw, which is of legendary proportion because Jay-Z bought 100 oh, yeah. copies of it, you know, yeah, for some yeah, box yeah. money. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, and, yeah, and to man. just see Nipsey, I mean, that, that hurt, that hurt. All. I remember when King gave me the call and was yeah. like, Nipsey gone. I'm like, what do you mean he's gone? He's like, he did. I'm like, oh, yeah. man. Yeah, man, that was that was uh, and then it was just so you know so his his his, his uh, fan base increased a hundredfold after he was dead, and so when people uh, you know not only learned about his work but learned about his music and stuff, man, he was he was a t- very talented artist and stuff, man. He was like and his business savvy. I mean, the dude exactly, right, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Exactly, man. So it was, yeah, that was, you know, when you think you know, about the, it, the, 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 the coronavirus, the COVID, and then the Nipsey, all of that stuff, man, was big. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we, we, we got, we, we stood in solidarity. We, you know, with the hip hop nation, you know, especially, you know, with Kobe, you know, this year, man, yeah. he died a day before my yeah. birthday. You know, shout out wow. you know, in heaven to, yeah, man, that was, I was at work. And then, you know, uh, King hit me up on a text and was like, you hear about Kobe? I'm like, what? He like the helicopter crash. Everybody, I'm like, oh, man. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, shout out to him, Gianna, yeah. you know, the other seven people aboard. Uh, you know, right. um, 
you know, one thing about it is that, though, you all have really, you know, when you look at, you know, what L.A., um, California has meant to the hip-hop culture, you know, because you all have not always gotten the respect you deserve for what you all have contributed in so many ways. And, um, you know, we... You know, we've had a lot. We've had a lot of West Coast artists on the show. You know, we we are connected with a lot of people. Shout out to Dire Lansky, of course, Guy Four. You know, Twan Gotti. You know, uh, you know, and just thinking about Nipsey in terms of what he meant to us, because Nipsey heard one of our shows before, like the day before, a couple of days before he was killed. You know, shout out to Twan Gotti because he played Nipsey a clip of our show, and Nipsey liked it. You know, we were in the process of trying to get Nipsey on the show, you know. Wow. Um, so, yeah, that, that, but we know Nipsey saw us, and, you know, uh, we, we are just so humbled. We're appreciative. And, you know, shout out to 60s, you know, man. I mean, Pat Man, the Gun Man, G.I. Joe, you know, Jay Stone, you know, who flying that all money in flag, still keeping it true blue out of the hood, man. They doing it for the hood, right. you know, in Nipsey's name, you know, so. You know, much right. love for Crenshaw, 60s, all y'all, man. You know. Uh, right. See, that's the reason why I say and stuff, you know, VIP is and always have been and will be all hoods because at one point we were located in Compton, Inglewood, Pasadena, West L.A., you know, <laughs> the whole circle and stuff, and uh We've uh, done a lot of good things in all of those communities. Uh, you know, VIP, Long Beach get the most uh, attention, but oh, we had great stores uh, in all of these uh, different areas of L.A. County. Now, before we go, because we can't forget to shout out, you know, some of the new talent coming out there, like Stupid Young and P-Nice. What's it like? You know, and uh, Akeem Zaire, what's it like seeing them make their way, you know, being the next wave of the West Coast on uh, for the Long Beach? Yeah, well, yeah, man, they're they doing their thing, man. I'm real, real, real proud of them. And uh, uh, one more that I got my eye on is uh, D3, the rock star. Uh, okay. And if you don't know about it, you need to know about it. Yeah. We can't D3. forget Young Zeke either. The you rock see, stuff. Right. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, 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 exactly. So, yeah, they still, you know, they they making waves and stuff, man. They uh, still uh, uh, being uh, active in social media. Uh, yeah, Young Zeke and quite a few of them. You know, I'm, I'm proud of taking the banner and running with it. Well, you know, this is, we're about to close shop on this show, and this two hours is one of the most terrifically rewarding and enriching on the hip-hop education that is VIP Records, world famous. I mean, you know, we are so humbled. We thank you so much for your time, Mr. Anderson. We love you. We cherish you, protect you, and world famous VIP at all costs. Shout out to Long Beach, 562-213. Look, 323 out in all of L.A., man, look, you know, it's all love, man. It is all love. Right, right. East to West. Um, right. Any well, shout-outs you want to give um, before we uh, go shout-out? Well, any... Yeah, you know, I want to get a shout-out to all of the, the independent retailers coast-to-coast that uh, uh, played a major part of uh, this uh, hip-hop business being, you know, what it what it became what it came to be and uh you know we uh you know and and to uh you know all of the artists that have been through here uh the customers uh you know and shout out to you guys for having me on uh i'm a, I'm, I'm a fan now i'm gonna be checking in from time to time and, off the uh, cuff you radio know, you will always have a home at off the cuff radio Mr. <laughs> you will always be welcome here right, anytime well. you want to come back yeah. any artist you want to refer to us please feel free yeah well I, i'm gonna do just that you know it's a few caps and stuff that uh i want you guys to check out and uh uh you know you you got the number now so you can use it anytime we appreciate, appreciate you it, so much thank you all right, then. So, 
uh, we'll we'll check with you later. Yes, we All will. Right, y'all be safe Peace and God bless. Thank you. Be safe. All right. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.